but I I'm setting it up. <laughs> Click. 
Sorry about that. I probably should have been quicker as I was talking. Anyway, um, so if you receive Clean Water Act 106 funding from EPA, there's three reporting requirements. The first one is a monitoring strategy or a quality assurance program plan, or a QAP or a QAP. There's lots of names. Um, in other regions, this may be two separate documents, but in Region 9, it's usually just one. The second is water quality data submitted into EPA's Water Quality Exchange, WQX. And the third is a water quality assessment report, or a WQAR. Um, and there may be other deliverables to submit to your Clean Water Act 106 project officer, just such as quarterly reports or other things, um, depending on your work plan tasks. Um, a QAP, a QAPP, is required before any monitoring begins using Clean Water Act 106 funds. A QAP should contain monitoring objectives, design, water quality indicators, quality assurance, data management, analysis and assessment, and programs and protocol for reporting. They're developed by tribes and reviewed and approved by EPA's Region 9's quality assurance staff, and they need to be updated every five years. So this slide goes over the process for getting a new or revised QAP approved. Um, and it can be a little bit of a lengthy process, I wish I could see this slide. Um, but we'll work with the project officer to figure that out, and then we'll direct you to the, our QA office, our quality assurance office, and they're really helpful in helping tribes develop their claps, and are really knowledgeable, and are happy to help folks out. At this time, I'm going to pass it over to Kate, who's popping up here now. Um, I appreciate you guys' time. Thanks for joining us at the third day, fourth day. It's my fault. I wanted to use the stage, so any hiccups are on me. Um, all right, so as Kelly mentioned, the second reporting requirement is submitting data to WQX. You may see on this slide, there's a new 106 guidance that was just published this year in January, and one of the changes impacts this reporting requirement. Um, the previous guidance, which was published in 2007, so an update was greatly needed, was just that you had to submit compatible data, WQX compatible data, meaning that it just had the right metadata um, associated with your results. Um, to uh, two project officers. So this could just be a spreadsheet. Um, the, the change in the 106 guidance is now that we're more, we're pushing to have um, the data actually submitted directly into WQX. Um, and this will be a requirement that will be reflected in your grant terms and conditions for your 106 funding starting next year. So when you apply for funding next year, you'll probably have some conversations with your project officer about there are some exceptions allowed. If, you're, if you really don't think you're going to be able to do this, talk to your project officer. We'll be able to grant some exceptions, but know that it is formal, more formally required in the 106 guidance now with that change in January. Um, and uh, just wanted to note, we do have WQX assistance downstairs from uh, our headquarters contact. So um, I'm going to talk more about the WQ, WQX assistance available a little bit later, but. Feel free to go talk to Adam, even if you leave the room right now, go talk to him downstairs, past the vendors, I won't be offended. Um, if you hear, oh, this is required now, like, go ahead, go downstairs. Um, so, when you're submitting data into WQX, and if you attended Adam's presentation Tuesday at 11, if you didn't, it should be recorded so you can go back and listen to it. There's three main categories of data when you're submitting data into WQX. Um, your project information, so why were you collecting that data? In some cases, it may just be, this is 106 funding, and you have, it's part of your 106 program. You may have more specific programs, like a harmful algal bloom monitoring program that you designate different projects for. So that's an example of the different projects available. And then you'll also submit your monitoring location information. This tends to be like X, Y coordinates, et cetera. Where did, was it a lot, lake, river, stream, et cetera. And then results. What, um, what were the actual um, 
uh, numbers that were reported. So what were your pH levels or your dissolved oxygen levels? So well, you can kind of see the light changes. The slide actually changes. Cool. Um, so this is on the slide is some screenshots of the template that's available to help you submit data into WQX. You don't have to use this template. Again, Adam talked about some of the different options at his session on Tuesday. Um, but the template does help make sure that you're submitting all the required information. Everything that's starred up here on this um, on this screen, and if you have trouble seeing it, you know, project name, identifier, monitoring location, lat long, um, your collection method, activity type, those are some of the required components of the data that you're submitting into WQX. Um, but you, you can also use your own format of spreadsheet. You just have to use what's called an import configuration to make sure you're translating or WQX can translate what's in your spreadsheet to what needs to go into WQX. And it can also be helpful to talk to your lab, whatever labs, if, you have, if you're seeing, sending samples to your lab, to make sure you're getting results in an electronic format that makes it easier to put um, some of the data into WQX. And as I mentioned, if you need help submitting WQX data, again, Adam is downstairs, he's really helpful, or anytime they're available virtually, if you contact the WQX help desk, it's wqx.epa.gov, they also have a phone number. There's also a lot of resources online. There's videos, there's guidance documents. You can also talk to your project officer. We may just end up sending you to Adam or the WQX help desk, but it, you, know, you can always start with us too. And um, the next few slides just talk about some of the common monitoring methods and parameters that are used um, and submitted into WQX. So with field sampling, a lot of folks are using you know, SONs um, with parameter sensors or probes. Um, most commonly, you're monitoring dissolved oxygen, pH, temperature, conductivity, turbidity, um, and also macroinvertebrates are also fairly common. Um, some challenges with this is maintaining the equipment, just trying to make sure that equipment is expensive. Sometimes it can be like picky about how it's um, maintained, so make sure you're reading like the guidance documents, reach out to the companies that you bought it from. Um, you know, it is an eligible expense under the 106 program, but it's also good to make sure it's maintained and, you know, reach out for training as well. Um, I think in this picture on this slide was a workshop we had in 2017 in Arizona. We're trying to have something similar fairly soon, but um, more information on that coming. Uh, Slide. And then some samples are sent to a lab. So um, cyanobacteria, there was just a session on that before lunch. Um, metals, nutrients, bacteria, um, those are some things you might be sending to a lab. And again, it's helpful to talk to them about getting that in like a helpful format for reporting. Um, again, uh, we recognize there's some challenges sometimes with holding times. You know, sometimes those samples have to get to a lab at a certain time. So maybe when you're picking a lab to choose from, think about that in terms of um, you know, uh, thinking about, talk to them about when um, you might be able to get samples to them if that's going to work. Um, and if you have any questions about some of the parameters I just talked about, there's uh, water quality parameter fact sheets on our website as well. Um, they're linked from our Region 9 page, or I think I've included the headquarters page on this slide. And they uh, go over uh, why the parameters are monitored, what factors can affect changes in these parameters, recommended criteria, and some monitoring tips. Um, they're, the ones that are currently available are temperature, pH, DO, turbidity, macroinvertebrates, E. coli, nutrients, and habitat assessment, and metals. So that's a really good, relatively new resource. Okay, so that should be. Um, so the third reporting requirement that we're gonna be talking a good amount today is the water quality assessment report. So the quack is like, how you're gonna do your monitoring, the WQX data is your results, your data results, and then this is kind of your interpretation of the data. Um, similar to your water quality data, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, is that that's an annual requirement. So every year you should submit your data to, into WQX. The WQAR is similar, water quality assessment report. You should submit that annually. The new guidance actually 
allows for some flexibility to make you submit it every two years. Make sure you talk to your project officer about that to see if it's a good fit. Um, and it's just a narrative and graphical account of tribal water quality um, includes the program's interpretation of the data and assessment methodology used. And um, over on the next slide, um, the, that we have a template that you can use to make sure that you address all the factors that were on the previous slide, which what, um, was an atlas of tribal water resources, a narrative description of the monitoring program, um, tables describing you know, whether or not the water bodies are meeting uses and causes and sources of impairment um, and your results and then any issues of concern. So this template on this slide here um, is available on our website, epa.gov slash tribal slash R9 tribal 106. And it takes care of all those components for you. So it's not required to use, but we really encourage it for some reasons I'll go over. Um, but it, basically each line has a water body and then you say what parameters you monitor there, whether or not um, they were meeting the uses or the criteria that you're using. If you don't have your own standards, you can use EPA recommended criteria as your benchmark or nearby state standards. Or if you have, you know, tribal benchmarks that you want to use. Um, it's pretty flexible in the template. This is not a regulatory program. Um, and, it's, and this template was developed to make it easier. But again, it's not required. You can still just submit, you know, like a Word document or tables, either way. But one reason it's kind of nice to use the template is we're able to compile some of the information from that template. So the next few slides are going to go over some of the data we've been able to glean from the templates that have been submitted. So this would be data um, that was reported or water quality assessments that were reported for like the 2022 monitoring period, um, probably turned in the latest, like early of this year. And there shouldn't be any tribal specific identified information, it's all compiled. Um, and about 100 tribes receive 106 funding every year. So you see on the very top left box, it um, indicates that 47 tribes used the template last year. Uh, or the most re recent reporting period. Um, and so that's about half. And that's, that's okay, like I said, it's not required, but it is kind of nice because then you can get these big picture, things, um, big picture uh, uh, understanding of what's going on in tribal water. So those 47 templates reflected uh, 348 water bodies that were monitored that year with a total of 444 monitoring stations. And the left pie chart, shows how frequently those monitoring stations were being um, monitored. And um, uh, you can see that at, at, at about half of the monitoring stations are being monitored at least on a quarterly or triannual basis, and about a quarter are being even monitored more than quarterly. Um, the bar graph on the right shows the topmost um, monitored parameter. So it goes pH, temperature, turbidity, dissolved oxygen, Etc. This kind of makes sense because the guidance that I mentioned before that was published in 2007 had some core monitoring parameters, and a lot of these are from those core monitoring parameters. So there's a lot of tribes that are like, we have to monitor these under our 106 program. It's a little more flexible now under the 106 guidance. While these are still some of the basic monitoring parameters, and I'd recommend monitoring them, we recognize you may have you know different priorities, and so these are no longer there's no longer like specific core um, parameters that you have to monitor according to the 106 guidance, but I still recommend them. They're good ones to monitor. And usually pretty straightforward if you have like multi parameters on your system. Um, so, next slide is getting more into the interpretation. Um, so, on the pie chart to the left, we can see. Um, uh, the water quality status as interpreted by, this tri by tribes in these uh, water quality assessment reports. About half are satisfactory, but about half are impaired for some reason. So that means like um, maybe pH was higher or lower than you know the benchmarks used, or you know maybe nitrogen was a little higher, temperatures were a little high. So um, that's what's that's these pie charts and all these graphs are you know what the tribes reported as. You know, either satisfactory or impaired. 
Um, and then the pie chart on the right is the change in water quality since the start of the monitoring period. So um, in this case, a good amount are being maintained or improved, but some are being you know, further degraded since the beginning of the monitoring period. <clears throat> and um, in these templates, you can also indicate what are the likely sources of these impairments. So um, on the top bar graph, it's you know, what are uh, they're listed. It's kind of weird the, the highest one is at the bottom, but it, the top one reported is an unknown point source or um, an upstream or off-reservation off source or wet weather discharges or agriculture. Those are some of the top ones reported. And then at the bottom graph talks about the high or the most common tribal pools and designated uses. So this is um, not unexpected to have aquatic life as a, as a top uh, use for water bodies and then also culture, cultural use, secondary contact and primary contact. Those are, you can see why those would be important to tribes um, in terms of uses. <clears throat> and then on this slide, um, so um, a few slides ago I showed one screenshot of the template. This is another tab on the template that addresses that tribal water atlas that I mentioned that's part of the water quality assessment report. Um, so this is indicating, you know, the total distance of area of waters on the reservation and how many miles or areas that you're monitoring. Um, and this may not change much year to year unless you're adding new trust land to your reservation, which should be in your TAS or FAE application package, or if you um, added new monitoring stations, which should be reflected in your quality assurance project plan. Um, and um, you may note that there's an off reservation box. That's because, as I think Danielle mentioned in questions in a previous conversation, there's, there are some cases where you can monitor off reservation. Um, if you have permission from the landowner, you can make connections to the waters on the reservation. Um, so that's why we have that box there in case you are and you're using 1600 to do that. And then um, another aspect of the template is the, uh, is the, is, are any projects you're doing to address any possible impairments. So um, these tend to be 319 projects. So if you're working on any runoff projects to reduce, for example, nitrates that are in the water, this is, make, this is where you would reflect that. <clears throat> And so uh, the next few slides are um, summary information from the atlas portion of the template. So the top graph is the total lake acres and wetland acres. So the numbers on the left are the total um, lake acres on the reservation and the smaller number next to it is the total lake acres that are monitored. Um, same for wetland acres. And then also below that is streams and groundwater wells that are monitored. Um, and, and then I think this may be the last of the summary slides, yeah. So, and then the last one I have is for stream and estuary miles. So again, um, the larger number is the total on the reservations and then the smaller number is the amount monitored for both streams and estuaries. Not too many estuary miles monitored, which makes sense. Um, okay, so I just wanted to, briefly touch on the attains pilot, and some of this might sound familiar if you went to um, Adam's presentation, but uh, attain stands for assessment TMDL, or total maximum daily load. It's an acronym within an acronym, tracking and implementation system. And some tribes in another region were like, this water quality assessment report, it's too complicated. I wanna be able to report my water quality assessments another way, or like a streamlined way, or you know, they didn't have the region I come for the template I mentioned is just region nine. We've shared it with other people, but pretty much only region nine uses it. Is it. Um, but um, some tribes in other regions were like, we want a different option. Um, so headquarters initiated this a team's pilot, and it's another way to uh, electronically report your water quality assessment. It doesn't do the assessments for you. I know that would be amazing and magical, but it doesn't. Um, uh, you have to develop an assessment methodology, which basically says this is how we're making our assessment decisions. You know, we take all the data collected for this time period and compare it against this criteria, etc. 
Um, and this slide should show the project timeline. So this, it started in 2016, which was about a while, a while ago. And since then there's been some training and 12 out of the 15 pilot tribes started reporting in the teams in January 2018. So um, there were three tribes from region nine that, part, that were part of the initial group. One is still participating. Um, one had some issues with cross state boundaries that's now um, fixed. So if you do have cross state boundaries, it is possible to report in the teams. Um, and there was some more training and reflection and we decided to continue this pilot. The tribes that were using it seemed to like the reporting method and so they um, solicited for new participants. We didn't get any new Region 9 participants, but there was someone from Region 8 that the Region 9 person mentored. Um, and so there was some training and mentorship and more submissions. And along the way to um, EPA started publishing some of the assessment results in How's My Waterway, which is an EPA website where you can see, you know, what is the water quality in these different watersheds and are they meeting uses? It's a really interesting website to check it out. Um, we have one region nine tribe on there, Hoopa, who has a, a tribal page for How's My Waterway that you can check out. And just recently we solicited for new, like a round three almost of participants. And there's two new region nine tribes that are participating. So Again, this is like an optional thing. You don't have to use the teams, but I just wanted to let you know this is kind of the alternative that's being sussed out for water quality assessment reports. Um, and one thing that's kind of nice about it is, you know, we went through all the manual reports, and I say we, some of you may remember so Sophia Sotomayor, she's in our section. She recently left to go to grad school, which is great. She went, she actually compiled all those graphs that I went over before she came, before she left the grad school. So, but it takes a lot of manual effort to go through and compile all that, but a team does it automatically, which is really nice. So here's some summary information from an team's report, talking about what parameters were monitored um, and whether or not they met criteria. Same for the designated uses, aquatic life, recreational drinking water, um, whether or not those uses are being supported or not. But I mentioned the Hoopa Tribal How's My Waterway page. Uh, it should be up on the screen now. It shows like a graph of where it's located and it'll color code like these waters were meeting criteria uses or not. And then you can also go into each specific use. I think this green flag is swimming. Swimming? Swimming? I think swimming. Um, and whether, you know, how many of the waters were meeting that use. I would definitely go check it out. Um, just to make sure you all are all awake, what are the 106 reporting requirements? Or if you just want to name one. Does anyone want to name one? Yes! A quack! Yes! What's the third one? Yes! Ah, way to go. I don't know. There's some, at least some people are like, yes. Okay. We're almost, there's not much more. So thanks for hanging in there. And then there's time here for questions, hopefully. Um, okay. I'm just going to talk about a couple resources that are available for some of these reporting requirements. So we just went over them flat data, water quality assessment report. Um, one of them is called the Tribal Roadmap. And this is mostly to help with your WQX submissions. So you can go through and answer a few questions about your water quality program. And once we answer those questions, it'll develop like a tailored guide to say, here are the next steps you should take, um, and maybe some tips for you know how you should collect your data, how you should report your data. Um, if you haven't registered for WQX or if you don't know your organization ID, which is a component of being registered in WQX. It'll tell you, you know, what steps to take to get registered. So this is a good place to start. Or if you've had some staff turnover and you're not really sure, um, you know, where you're at in your program, this would be a good um, resource to check in on. It's available on our website. There used to be a second component that would do some data analysis. I think that hasn't been updated in a while. So if you see a second tab, 
that's not really working. Partly because headquarters has been focused on this ta-da project, tools for automated data analysis. Um, and it's intended to have all of these components on these slides, data discovery, assessment, um, criteria and methodology, and assessment unit parameter level analysis. Uh, right now, it just does some of the quality control screening, and it's an R-based application. You don't necessarily need to know how to use R to use it, I believe. Um, but yeah, it still works, and if you have any input on what kinds of things you want to see in it, um, it's definitely very much an input, and I are in progress, and I put a contact for more information there in the website for it. But we're really hoping this will be a valuable tool for tribes to do uh, water quality data analysis. There's also tons of information on EPA's website. Um, so water quality monitoring and assessment resources and tools and water data and tools. I suggest just going, checking out some of these websites because they have some really interesting things. Uh, for example, there's a stormwater calculator that you can access na many national databases that provide like soil, topography, rainfall, and operation information if you're interested about you know, stormwater issues on your reservation. And then also, I sort of mentioned this earlier, but our guidance was just updated. So um, Danielle in there was a big part of that, and some tribes in Region 9, we also had um, uh, tribal representation on the work groups to update this guidance. We wanted to make sure your voices were heard as we were updating it, you know, what things were needed as um, we made sure it was updated with helpful and accurate information. Um, it was published in 2023. It's available online. We're supposed to get some hard copies. I haven't seen them arrive in our office yet, but hopefully as we're doing site visits in the future, we can bring some. So I know, you know, even though we want to be like environmentally friendly and not use too much paper, sometimes it's just nice to have like a paper guidance in your hand. Um, but that's available online. And I think that might be it. I don't know where Kelly went, but. Oh, do you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, you mentioned that. Um, Adam let, me, let me give you the nice Oh, that's a good point. Thanks for mentioning that. So, Adam from headquarters is on East Coast time. So, if you're interested in making like a virtual appointment, he's, he's on West Coast time right now in the building. But in the future, um, it's a good idea to keep that in mind if you're making a virtual appointment. Good point. Or submitting a ticket. Or, or submitting a health ticket. Yeah, so you may not get help after like 1 p.m. Yeah. Eddie sounds like he has experience with this. <laughs> um, okay, well, so that's it for 106 reporting requirements. It seems like we're well ahead of schedule. Any questions? Oh, there's one in the back. Sorry, I've been pointing a lot, and that's not always. I, I feel like I've asked this a, a couple of times, or at least alluded to it a couple of times, and still confused. But when when we're reporting our data to EPA, does EPA then take that impaired status and go to bat for us? I mean, what what happens to fix the impairments? Because like we have TMDL, TMDLs for two parameters, and they're waived. They're waived. Know, the waivers. And yeah. I wonder, you know, I mean, we've got E. coli, we've got temperature, we've sediment problems, all these all these problems, and we keep gathering the data and reporting it, and I, I just feel like we're in the cycle of doing it, and what, what changes? What happens? Does EPA go to bat for us? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, before you hand the mic over too much, just for context, can I ask where you're located? Scott Valley. Okay. Um, well, so first of all, I'll say, you know, the 106 program is intended, one of its main purposes is for water quality monitoring. Um, so you're collecting data and say, and so that you can identify, um, you know, where you might be seeing exceedances. It sounds like you're seeing some, um, I'm not sure what criteria you're using, um, but it sounds like you are seeing things above what you would like them to be. Um, and as I mentioned on one of the slides, we do indicate 
there's a section for where you can indicate maybe 319 projects that are helping to address reduce, uh, you know, reducing nitrogen, for example, if you have runoff issues. Um, there is like a little bit of a regulatory gap in terms of TMPLs on it on uh, federal, federally recognized Indian reservations, um, just like the the uh, baseline water quality standards are trying to address like a gap in water quality standards on federal Indian reservations. There's also, we don't currently create TMPLs on federal Indian reservations if you're identifying, you know, an exceedance. There's, there's no tribes that have 303 P authority for TMPLs. Um, you can't take it upon yourself to use your 319 funding to, you know, address those pollutant issues that you're identifying, and that's part of the purpose of the 106 program. Um, and we're also working on that at EPA, and I encourage you to work with state partners nearby. I, I think I heard you speak up in one of the state sessions about this and making sure that states are have access to your data, perhaps, and using it and incorporating it into their um, TMPL project identifi identifications. But yeah, it is a little bit of a gap right now. I mean, we you can work with your project officers. We can try to talk with colleagues in our office to address your specific needs. Um, yeah, uh, I encourage you to use your team funding to work on any projects that can help address some of the pollutants. Sorry, that may not be the best thing. Oh, yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, one of the things that I just want to address with, you know, the Water quality assessment reports that, that is a requirement under the 106 program. We don't just collect the data and not do anything with it, as Kate was showing the examples of what we do with the data that we receive. Um, but we are not the only ones that show off like what, what the data is, right? We're handing them to headquarters to, to show why we need to keep the 106 funding that we have and why we need to increase it. So I just want to also mention like that's another kind of plug for using our template, is that we can collect that data and then show why we need an increase in funding um, under the 106 program and 319 for that matter. Okay. I think I saw some other questions. All right. Um, so I can totally ask Adam or if anyone else has this answer, but um, a lot, of our, I know for my tribe, we've been putting in our data to store it, and it's um, data since the, the 80s. And I know that um, Adam said that there's a way to train the uh, WQX to read your Excel because our storage is in an Excel um, spreadsheet sort of format. Um, because both of those are EPA um, documents, is it easier or um, this, or is it easy to just transfer the store numbers directly to WQX, or do I have to still train the WQX to take in the, the or read the store data? Well, first, I definitely recommend talking to Adam, but to answer a couple aspects of your question, store it kind of got replaced by WQX, so store it's like Kind of out of commission. We still refer to it just because some people don't always recognize WQX as the new platform, but it kind of transitioned from store it to WQX. So theoretically, yes, if you have data in a store it compatible format, it should be easily transferable to WQX. Um, I definitely recommend talking to Adam about that though. Does that answer your question? Yes, my um, or our technicians are not going to be too happy because they just finished putting in the data to store it. So. Well, I don't know where they put it, but store it shouldn't exist anymore. So, I, I yeah, we have maybe they got actually put it in WQX. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, some people still. Oh, Eddie was saying it automatically re redirects you from if you try to go to store it, it redirects you to WQX. Is that what you're saying? 
Yes. Yeah, and you'll automatically get redirected now. So you, so now I use the push tracks directly, but if you use the old website, try to log in, it just redirects you and you log in that way. Uh, yeah. Also, the one thing you'll have to check is the mod, the little codes at the end of like uh, the different acronyms and stuff like that. There's certain cells that are like, are uh, required now that they've done minor uh, updates to um, throughout the years. And so if you get an error, you can just reach out to um, the help desk and be like, hey, I don't know what's going on. And you can get it, uh, take a screenshot and they'll kind of help troubleshoot what you need. And something's like, oh, well, you uh, had a negative reading, so you don't, you shouldn't have a concentration limit. And I was like, okay, right. So you remove that from that cell and then all of a sudden it works. Reminding things that the help desk help uh, it's uh, when you submit stuff. Okay. So hopefully they're okay. And I don't have to do anything. Maybe we just got redirected. I think I saw another hint at some point. Maybe not. Go scan. Anyone else? Oh, there's one. Oh, in the back. Thank you. Would it be possible just to go back to your slide on the resources that you would Yeah. I mean, there are, there are a couple, but like, here's some web pages. Is that the one? Or are they back? Back. Yeah, that yeah. It's not as robust at the moment as I wanted it to be. There used to be more assessment resources and then as they funneled more resources into DAW, I think there hasn't, and with staff changes, they haven't been as maintained as well, but um, hopefully to DAW is good. Um, Uh, on that slide there, it shows water quality assessment report and SADAW in progress. Um, is that stating that the water quality assessment report is supposed to be uh, reported in SADAW? No, SADAW is like a tool in development to um, help you with your water quality assessment. So um, it's not fully capable of doing the assessments yet. I just wanted to flag it as something. You don't have to do anything in the right now. It can there there's some quality control data cleaning capabilities in it right now if that's a need of yours, but at the moment it, it doesn't actually do any assessments. Yeah. Uh, is use so is that going to be um you know when it is up and running? Uh, is that going to be a requirement? No, it's just supposed to be a tool that can help you make assessments. Okay, thank you. My super colleague really like. I'm kind of bad to discuss all these questions because I was over it relates to acrylate basin and the state set TMBL for mercury and nutrients to like. And he said those those areas are off reservation, so it's hard for the tribe to enforce their thing on it. But the states have delegated the power to set those TMBLs. If the tribes in their basin feel the states not taking their responsibility well enough to protect our waters. How does the EPA go to that? Or how does the EPA review if a tribe not happy with the state's uh, oversight of TMBLs? How can the EPA, or does the EPA tell it help to find the Yeah, that's a good question. I, I wish someone from our standards and assessment section were here because they work on TMBLs. Um, I don't know, I don't think I see anyone. If there's anyone online, Eddie, you go to the Okay. <laughs> so I've been on a TMBO work group for like nine years now on the Santa Margarita River and basically through 
the different agencies. So for example, in California, it's the uh, regional water boards that do the triennial reviews. So when it's that time to do your review, usually they start to look at the TMBOs in the basin and also on their standards. And that's the time when you engage as to them if you're a stakeholder, um, because uh, that's just the framework that they have. And so you then comment on the TMBOs and they, depending on where you're at, some states are better than others, some water boards are better than others, but uh, for San Diego Water Board, they've been really good about like, taking our input and seeing um, our concerns. At the same time, they're wary of the other stakeholders, mostly the regulatory community, about the impacts to their permits. That's the big thing. Most, most regu regulated uh, facilities are worried about compliance and meeting the requirements and the costs associated with reducing pollution. Uh, and uh, the bigger one in a lot of places in California is with ag. You know, ag is not point source, so there's real no, no firm way to regulate them like point sources. And so that's where we've been having discussions with the local ag groups, the, the, the different um, farmers uh, associations in China work with them and give them incentives. It's, it's not perfect, and uh, unfortunately, uh, EPA sits on our board, and I don't recall who it is from EPA, but they usually have someone who will review the TMDO and ensure that it is uh, up to standard, that it's sufficient. And so when, when you do get on those boards, it's good to have EPA contacts and you can have more of a direct uh, relationship with them. And I've talked to, I forget her name, but I think so, yeah. Yeah, and so and we've commented on things like, well, they can't incorporate preservation into their calculations because they don't have jurisdiction over the reservation, and they adjusted their maps. And then it's like, well, they can't consider us as open space and part of their open space like offset. So and then that helps change the TMDLs and it helps push them towards uh, a more realistic uh, number. And it's not perfect, but it's the structure that we have right now, unfortunately, based on the law. And so, yeah, priority reviews and whenever they do TMDO updates, uh, you'll get a notification and it'll be like a list of water bodies, what they're listed for, what they're proposing, and then that's when you have the opportunity to comment. And if anything, reach out to your EPA contact on that TMDO and then just tell them, hey, I really would like assistance with either drafting a letter or a joint like comment to try to get bigger concessions from them because a lot of tribal lands are being impacted by off reservations. And so uh, to uh, someone else's point, it's like the 106 is really great if you have data that shows, hey, every year we're monitoring and we're always impaired. And it's usually at this part of the stream where like upstream discharges are coming in through, through the reservation and you see a significant impact to water quality. And that's when you kind of tie in everything and that helps make a more of us uh, argument because the state agency is going to want you to provide evidence and support supporting documents. Thanks, Eddie. And yeah, I think we're running out of time here, but also, I mean, we don't work on TMBLs as product officers, but you're always welcome to convey concerns to us and then we can talk to the people in our office that can advocate in those situations, like for example, Southern California, it sounds like, you know, there's someone that reviews those TMPLs. So if you're not sure who that is, we can also find that out for you as your product officer. And as I said, we don't specifically work on TMPLs, but we, we can connect you to the people. Um, but yeah, I think it is 151 now, so I think we're supposed to wrap this up for the next session. But you really quickly, oh, it's online answer. Uh, oh, and there's a question online. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Adam Cancer says, hello, are there any resources that help us identify or set parameters within the spec, or where can we find standard EPA parameters in the spec? The standard parameter, what was the last part of it? Uh, where can we find standard EPA parameters within the spec? Okay, um, well, as I mentioned, like the super basic ones are in those water quality parameter fact sheets. You can find those online. That's like the very most basic place to start, and they do have recommended recommended criteria and monitoring tips on those fact sheets. If you want to go a little more in detail, um, for example, the water quality standards template for tribes does have all the 
EPA recommended criteria for like aquatic life and human health uses. So that's one resource that you can use. You can also check out the nearby state standards. So I don't know where this person is located, but for example, if they're in California, they could look up the California Water Basin Plan um, to see what criteria is nearby them. Those are all helpful resources, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you everybody for your questions and discussion. Um, thanks for joining us. Have a good rest of your day.